Hi guys, this is GSNMom.com and I'm here with a handset called the Yumi Touch for a full review. We're dealing with a metal unibody phablet with a big battery and Android Marshmallow on board. This device can be found on Gearbest.com, priced at around $140, which is a great price tag. So Yumi is a company with 10 years of experience and uh, this device was launched in February 2016 and it's a rival for the Xiaomi Redmi Note 3 and also the Verni Tor. Time to talk about the design, so design wise we get a 2.5D glass panel at the front, a metal unibody approach and the phone comes with a curved back, it's available in silver, grey or gold and it measures 8.8mm in thickness, while the Vernitor measured a slimmer 7.9mm. This one weighs almost 200 grams or better said 190 grams, so it's quite heavy in the user's hand and you can actually feel that. It's made using the CNC process for the metal and the back sheet of metal feels rather slim. It's a comfy phone and I would call the one hand usage pretty reasonable in spite of its size. We have comfy buttons, maybe in spite of the home one that feels a bit rigid. So I also have to mention that the phone has a top and bottom back area made of plastic for the sake of the antennas. It's a bit of a fingerprint magnet at the front and once again it's very heavy but still pretty comfy. Time to talk about the display. So this one is a 5.5 incher with a full HD resolution and an IPS LCD panel, also LTPS uh, technology. It uses Gorilla Glass 3 protection and since we have no video player we have to resort to the gallery to play our vids. So we got this test video here. And the conclusion, well, we're dealing with a clear image, okay brightness, it feels a bit too whitish sometimes, the colors are vivid, but not oversaturated, which is good, and the view angles are pretty wide. We also put the screen under the microscope, these are the pixels of the RGB stripes kind, then we measure the brightness and achieved 390 lux units, which is quite good, is the equal of the M-Star S700 and it beats the Sony Xperia Z5 Premium, still it's below the Xperia E4G. Now if we go into the settings area, you can find quite a few features for the display. So we find mirror vision here, with three main tweaks for the picture mode, standard, vivid and user mode, that will let you Tweak the contrast, saturation, picture brightness, sharpness, color and temperature and dynamic contrast, so quite a few things to work with here. And aside from that we have brightness level, adaptive brightness and font options. So overall a pretty good screen considering the price tag. Now as far as the rest of the hardware is concerned, what we're getting here is a MediaTek MT6753 octa-core processor, clocked at 1.3 GHz. It to, uh, it's accompanied by the Mali T720 GPU as well as 3 GB of LPDDR3 RAM, 16 GB of storage and a micro SD card slot. The device does not suffer from lag, so there are no problems with lag here in case you're wondering. And I have to say that the performance is quite okay and it offers a pretty fluid user experience. Even if you have a lot of apps open in the background, you're running a game and you open new apps, no lag and good performance. Speaking of games, we played Riptide GP2, our usual benchmark title, and let's see how it was handled here. Let's turn down the volume a bit and go to career and check it out. So the graphics look fine, now let's see the actual gaming experience and just how responsive the device is. There is no frame rate drop, the water looks nice, nice speed effect and the controls are well read by the system. So gaming checks out. Now when it comes to the benchmarks, well we also did those and let's see how that panned out. Okay, so overall things to remember here, well we start off with Quadrant. In Quadrant we're at the level of the Lenovo Fab Plus while in Antutu 6 we gravitate around the level of the Vernitor, we actually beat the Vernitor by 1000 points and in 3D Mark we got past the Huawei P8 Lite while in Geekbench 3 we were on the level of the Huawei P8 Lite. So generally we gravitate between the Huawei P8 Lite and Vernitor with similar benchmarks or better ones. Ok, we're done with the benchmarks, then talk about the temperature and we recorded 36.1 degrees Celsius after running the GFX bench benchmark and after playing the game Riptide GP2, 40 degrees Celsius, which is just at the limit of overheating. However, 
after I used the device for a long time and gaming it felt a bit too hot for a proper use so keep that in mind if you plan on long gaming sessions. Now as far as the battery goes on paper everything sounds very fine 4000 mAh unit inside here made by Sony and uh, it promises 60 hours of talk time or 92 hours of music but let's see what it delivered in our tests so our battery results were 8 hours and 53 minutes of continuous HD video playback it's okay but I expected a bit more especially from such a big and heavy device at least it beats the HTC One A9 and Nexus 6P but it's still below the first generation of the Samsung Galaxy A5 and the Xiaomi Mi 4E in PC Mark we had a pretty positive result of 8 hours and 45 minutes of continuous simulated usage that's quite good it's exactly the same as the Galaxy A3 2016 it beats the Galaxy Note 5 and still is below the Huawei Mate 8 but still quite good the disappointment comes in the form of the long charging time 4 hours 32 minutes it's almost the longest we've ever tested on a smartphone and that's certainly a letdown now when it comes to the settings obviously the battery has its own options you have standby intelligent power saving and you have battery saver here basic options and optimization which is basically related to the dose feature from marshmallow so overall a mixed experience with some good elements but a huge huge charging time now as far as acoustics are concerned we don't get bundled headphones but we do get the big speaker here or at least it seems big and now let's see the music player so the music player is simply called music you can see it right here somehow it does not find the artists albums or song it just handles the recently added files and the equalizer well it's basically the stock one with uh, options that are related to genres these five channels of tweaks bass and surround and now time to actually listen to a tune or two or three So as you just saw there's a bit of muffling on a flat surface the sound is loud but a bit drowned the bass is okay and the sound feels better at 70% while at 100% it's a bit drowned by all the frequencies the high notes are pretty well rendered and aside from the muffling the results of the decibel meter were quite quite good here we go we got 87.4 decibels at the back which is excellent and 84.6 decibel at the front so a loss of 3 decibels between front and back actually the back result is the same one of the LG G3 we beat the LG G5 but we're still below the Nokia Lumia 930 we have FM radio and a few extra settings in the acoustic area here you can find sound enhancement with BS audio enhance loudness and surround Overall ok acoustics, not much to object, time to discuss the camera. So at the back we have a 13 megapixel shooter with a Sony sensor and a dual flash and at the front a 5 megapixel shooter with its very own flash right here. The camera app tends to open up pretty slowly and it's also not very complex so we don't have many options here. We have these effects. We also have the modes here, uh, if they're normal, picture in picture, and uh, panorama, and of course we have HDR and the other basic options like GPS, scene mode, white balance, image properties, then there's uh, anti-shake, voice capture, self timer, ISO, and finally filming with electronic image stabilization. Other than that, the zoom feels kind of slow, the interface also felt a bit laggy at times, and focusing as well as picture taking are both pretty slow as you can well see here ok time to go to the gallery and one thing I noticed is that our pictures had an f2.2 aperture and we surpassed 100 shots taken so that's nice we start off with the daytime gallery and some of these pictures were a bit whitish they had a layer of white on top of them we zoomed in onto this road sign with some detail loss generally the colors were good 
and then we move to the selfie that looks quite okay both in the texture of the skin and the hair and when you fire on the flash the front flash things are even better we did an HDR on this graffiti with pretty whitish results and the sky in the shots that include sky well it feels a bit burnt and a bit too white for my taste this is a picture in picture shot with both cameras being used and then we also did a panorama that was rather modest 60 to 88 pixels over 800 pixels and this shot is actually the HDR in action making everything exaggeratedly white we have a very nice close-up shot of this uh, small faucet in the park actually very good close-up and then nice texture of flowers and some very nice focus place so focus on this object and then on this one without too many problems nice texture of the trees and the monument pretty realistic colors here an okay clarity and decent zoom level on the flags and then we have a series of close-ups of flowers that are actually quite good landscape shots deliver pretty okay details we started to zoom in and I have to say I'm happy with what we saw and for $140 I have to say that the camera is pretty good it's about 10% below the Vernitor if you really want a comparison however it totally beats that model in the selfie area when it does a pretty good job so these are daytime shots this one is actually very good and now we go to the low light shots obviously taken at night here there is a bit of blur nothing very serious really the texture of the building is quite good the lighting capture is okay but I have to say that this is certainly no Samsung Galaxy A 2016 but still reasonably good for the price tag okay so that's the whole video capture not very far behind the Vernitor and even surpassing it in some areas when it came uh, that was the photo capture as I said before and now it's time for the video capture sadly it's not my favorite format it's 3 GPP I usually prefer MP4 we filmed in full HD at 30 frames per second and 70 mega per second bitrate now let's find the clips so we have this one here with pretty bad wind problems so the microphone cannot handle the wind sadly the images were a bit shaky and washed out when we zoomed in the clarity remained pretty okay the colors were good minus the sky and focus didn't cause us any problem the clarity was also pretty nice okay let's find another vid to give us an example and we got this one here the exposure change was good if not a bit sudden too bad for the washed out parts and the details that could have been a bit better during the night time well things were a big failure when it came to the video this is the nighttime video it has a big problem because the uh, frame rate drops to 11 frames per second and the bit rate to 3 mega per second then everything moves in frames and it looks rather poor so mixed video capture certainly below the big brands but okay for 3 GPP now time to test the browser and I'm going to access gsm.com and as you can see not the fastest browser in the world but pretty fluid scrolling and the virtual keyboard is quite comfy the benchmarks associated with the browser are quite poor now on the connectivity front let's see what we had so this is a dual sim phone and one of the slots becomes a micro sd slot both slots are 4g compatible but you can only use one at a time on 4g we got wi-fi abgn bluetooth 4.1 lt fdd gps and a turbo download feature that combines 3g or 4g with wi-fi as far as the calls are concerned we had an okay call volume and uh, the sound was a bit metallic sounding the microphone was so so and uh, I noticed that the Wi-Fi tends to drop every once in a while it loses the signal for some reason and that tends to bother me we also did some speed tests here and let's see what we achieved this is the 4G test in our area no this is actually the uh, Wi-Fi test in our area 69 mega per second in download and 25 in upload not bad the 4G one was earlier and let us achieve 58 mega per second and 41 mega per second in download and upload respectively could have been better but in the end decent results and i feel very sorry for the wi-fi signal loss every once in a while now when it comes to the software we're running android marshmallow mostly stock but with huge 
huge icons, I don't know if you can notice that, they're really big. And some of the icons have been changed. The widgets, they're the stock one, as you can see here. Multitasking involves keeping the home button pressed in order to trigger the carousel, while the drop down area shows the notifications and quick settings in typical stock fashion. Okay, time to analyze the settings. So what we got here is, for starters, gesture sensing. So you can do a MMS smart call, move photos in the gallery, take a picture in the camera, all with gestures in front of the device. Then we got smart wake with usual double tap to wake and drawing symbols to activate a variety of apps. Okay, then we have security, where you can trigger the pin to lock the screen and extra security caused by the fingerprint scanner right here at the front. Okay, so let's see how this works. So put my finger here, it works. Put it at 90 degrees. It worked finally and put it at 180 degrees and it works. So it's quite fast and the setup process also had a pretty good speed and uh, you just need to touch it. There's no need to press it. So fingerprint scanning checks out. As far as the pre-installed apps go, I'm happy to let you know that there's no bloatware. The app drawer has vertical scrolling and there are only 25 apps which gives me great joy so no bloatware only the basic apps only those from google and that's it now it's time for the verdict related to the yumi touch on the pro side it's an affordable phone that's comfy has a good screen good performance and uh, the battery result in the pc mark test was also pretty nice solid acoustics not bad pictures it has Android Marshmallow and of course it doesn't suffer from lag, it has pretty good performance and no bloatware. And on the cons side, it's quite heavy, it's actually huge and uh, also huge is the charging time. Video capture could be a bit better and there are too few camera options, also some burnt pictures and underwhelming video as well as the Wi-Fi drop, those are problems. In the end, it remains a heavy phone but uh, pretty solid when it comes to the performance and uh, the multimedia aspects like the screen brightness and the acoustics. It also stands out in some of the close-ups, some of the picture close-ups, and in the end it has marshmallow and no bloatware, which are nice things. So if you want a phone for multimedia and for long gaming sessions because the PC mark test, that's what it means, well, you'll probably prefer the Yumi Touch. And you probably play games on it and take selfies using the front flash, and that's about it. You can find it on Gearbest for $140. This is it from gsn.com. Bye bye.